So we'll take a few minutes to check out a problem from the 2007 AP Calc AB exam. Uh, it was problem number six, and that was a non-calculator question. And some of these questions that are a bit older, the algebra involved within them is a little bit more intensive than what's typically on exams nowadays. But if you take a calculus course in college, I'm sure most of your professors would be requiring for you to be able to work through some of the algebraic steps that we're going to be talking about as we discuss this question over the course of this video. And so what this problem sets us up with is a function that's defined right here. Uh, the weird thing about this function is that they give us this unspecified constant k and they tell us that k is a positive constant. The domain of this function is also provided to us right here. Uh, you can't have anything that's zero or negative going into the natural log function, so we're just going to be dealing with positive values for x in this particular function. Um, part A asks us to do two things, find f prime of x, find f double prime of x. So when you take f prime of x, this is a little bit weird to do, but it's something that you should be really, really familiar with. Think about if k were a 4. If k were a 4 and you were taking the derivative of 4x to the 1 half, you'd multiply that 4 by 1 half, subtract 1 from the exponent, and you'd be on your way. We, we take the exact same approach. We just don't get a nice answer. It's still going to be a result that's going to depend on k. So whenever we multiply this coefficient by that exponent, k times 1 half is going to be k over 2, subtract 1 from the exponent, derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. Uh, I clean that up a little bit before taking my next derivative. I'd rather avoid the quotient rule uh, when I take the derivative of this term as opposed to use it. So I went ahead and I turned that second term into x to the negative first. And then when I took that next derivative, I had an uglier coefficient in f prime than I did in f, but I took the exact same approach. I don't know the exact value of this, but I do know when I take the derivative of a number times x to the negative one half power, I'm simply going to multiply that number by that power. So when I multiply k over 2 by negative 1 over 2, I get negative k over 4, and then I knock that exponent down by 1. I multiply this coefficient, negative 1, by negative 1, and I get positive 1, and then I knock that power down by 1. Uh, and there's your first derivative and your second derivative, and we'll definitely be utilizing those over the course of the next few pieces. And in part B, they ask us for what value of k does f have a critical point at x equals 1. It goes on to say, for that value of k, determine if you have a max, a min, or neither at that x, and then as always, justify your answer. So the line of thinking here would need to be well, a critical point happens for one of two reasons. Either f prime of x is equal to 0, or f prime of x is undefined at a value that's in the function's domain. Uh, here's f prime of x from back in part a. I did simplify this a little bit, right? So the negative power I can move back beneath the fraction bar. I did that with both of those terms. And then I have these two nicer fractions to try to deal with as I try to make sense out of how to answer part b here. Um, the fact that the only time this fraction here or this fraction here, the fact that the only time that that happens is when x is equal to 0, but 0 is not in the function's domain, allows us to basically ignore this. So we're not looking for a place where f prime of x is undefined. That never happens in the function's domain. We're looking for a place where f prime of x is equal to 0. So if we set this derivative equal to 0, that's going to be a little challenging to handle because you're going to have an unknown value of the constant k and an unknown value for x. They've provided us with the value of x that we're supposed to use. So we know that the critical point happens at the x value of 1. So we can put 1 in place of the x's in our derivative. Uh, and then we can solve for k after we set that derivative equal to 0. And so if you add this 1 to the other side, multiply by 2, you get that when k is equal to 2, this function has a critical number at the x value of 1. I then had to try to figure out if I have a max, a min, or neither at that spot. 
And so I, I put two into my derivative in place of K, right? So I just tossed it right in place of the K in that numerator, cleaned it up a little bit, right? Two in the top, two in the bottom. I can reduce that to just a one and a one down there. So this is a nicer form of the derivative to use. And then you need to think about what your sign chart's gonna look like. The critical number that we're concerned with is the X value of one. So between zero and one, what's the sign of the derivative? Well, if, if I pick a test value here, it, it's, what we would want to pick from this interval is likely one half. I didn't pick one half. I picked one fourth. And the only reason why I picked that is because think about where you're going to put that X. You're going to put it underneath this root. And it's easier to deal with a root of one fourth than it is a root of one half. So that's why I picked the test value of one fourth to go into that derivative. Well, this is one divided by one half. If I multiply by the reciprocal, that's just two. And this is obviously one divided by one fourth. If I multiply this by the reciprocal, it's just positive four. And then two minus four is obviously a negative result. So we're looking at a negative value for the derivative between zero and one. On the other side of one, oops, this is an F prime of two here. This is actually F prime of four. Let me see if I can make that adjustment on the fly here with my mouse. Probably not going to look very pretty, but I picked four as opposed to two for the exact same reason as I picked one fourth as opposed to one half. I'm dealing with a square root, and I would rather deal with the square root of four than a square root of two. So when I do one divided by the square root of four, I get one half. And then when I subtract one fourth from one half, I'm dealing with a positive result. And so we can kind of see that our function is going to be decreasing to the left of one increasing to the right of one, that is enough to tell us that we have a local minimum at one, but this sign chart isn't going to get you the point for the justification. So just verbalizing what the sign chart tells you is going to get you that final point for justifying your answer. So the way that I said it here is one way to provide that justification. Uh, other ways can successfully justify that we have a local minimum at one, but this is what I chose to go with. And then the last part of this, this is the part where the algebra gets kind of messy. Um, you're, you're told that for a certain value of k, the graph has a point of inflection on the x-axis. Find this value of k. So from this sentence right here, point of inflection on the x-axis, we can hopefully reason out two things need to be happening. An inflection point is going to happen where your graph changes concavity. A graph changes concavity when the second derivative changes signs. In order for the second derivative to change signs, the second derivative must first equal zero or be undefined. Here's a simplified form of the second derivative that I just pulled up from part A. I'm not going to consider the second derivative being undefined here for the same reason that we didn't consider f prime being undefined back in part B. This fraction's undefined when x is zero. This fraction is undefined when x is 0, but this function is only defined if x is greater than 0. So I don't have to worry about the undefined aspect of f double prime. I just have to set f double prime equal to 0. Now, I can solve that for k. It's, it's not very nice, but I can add this fraction to the left-hand side. And then I can multiply the right side of this equation by that denominator to isolate k. And after doing so when you multiply by 4x to the 3 halves, you get that in the numerator divided by the x squared that's already in the denominator. And if you think about dividing like bases here, subtract your powers, 3 halves minus 2 is negative 1 half. Well, if it's x to the negative 1 half, I can re-express that as 4 over x, to, over x to the 1 half, which is 4 over square root of x. The other thing that doesn't really seem that significant, but you definitely have to take into account, is that this point is on the x-axis. If a point's on the x-axis, the y-coordinate of that point is 0. And if the y-coordinate is 0, the function value is 0 at that location. So if we set the function itself equal to 0, and then solve that for k, I can add the natural log to that side. I can divide by the square root of x. And what I have is these two different expressions for k but if k is equal to both of them, I should just be able to set those expressions equal to each other and solve for x. So when you set these expressions for k equal to each other, you have a crazy looking equation here. Uh, if you're going to solve this by hand, the, the step that makes sense to do first is to multiply the right side of this equation by the square root of x. And if you think about what that allows you to do, you're then going to have a square root of x in the top of the fraction and the bottom of the fraction that can cancel with each other. And then you just have 4 equals natural log of x. If you want to solve that, you've got to undo the logarithm with its inverse, which is 
the exponentiation. And if you exponentiate on the left-hand side, you end up with e to the fourth power. Tempting, we've done a lot of work, tempting to say, all right, well, I'm done. X equals e to the fourth power. That's actually not what this question asked for. It asked to find this value of k. So now we know the value of x that makes this happen, but we don't yet know the value of k. So you can plug into either this expression or this expression. I, I guess I didn't really do the thing that was most logical here. Now that I look back at what I did to, to wrap this up, I plugged into to this expression for what k was to figure out what my value of k actually was going to be. I should have just plugged it into here, right? If I just put e to the fourth in place of this x, I get 4 over the square root of e to the fourth, which is 4 over e to the second power, which is a little simpler than what I had to deal with in that numerator. But in an AP exam setting, you don't necessarily have to simplify it. That would just be something you need to be able to do if your teacher required it, your professor required it. Uh, so an AP exam grading situation, this result would be accepted. Uh, college professor, a lot of teachers probably going to require you to go to that though.